Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks for letting me into your ears, including Pele Glendale, Dustin Campbell, Tim Deputy, and brand new patrons, Andy and Peyton. Welcome, Yay. Andy and Peyton. On this episode of DTNS, CES 2024 rolls on. Everyone's gaga over Gigabyte's big monitor. sag aftras voice actor AI deal is not that well received by the actors. And Trisha Hershberger's going to share her secret CES finds from motherboards to the world's fastest shoes. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 10th, 2024 in Las Vegas. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, TV host and streamer, Trish Harshberger. Thank you for having me. This is so fun. Thank you for being here. This is so much fun. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to, to be in person. It is. And be at CES. Uh, we have a lot of CES news we got to crank through. So just, you know, hang out. Let us know what you think of it as Sarah and I work through it. I'm excited. I'll be the hype girl over here. Fantastic. Let's start with the quick hits. OpenAI launched its GPT store where you can get custom chatbots if you pay for ChatGPT. OpenAI says users have made more than 3 million bots already, so it will be highlighting some of those weekly in its store. You can get the apps if you pay for ChatGPT Plus or Enterprise, as well as a new tier called Teams. That'll go at $30 per user per month. Teams is meant for businesses with around 150 people and adds access to GPT-4, Dolly 3, and advanced data analysis. Later this year, OpenAI says it will begin a revenue share with developers based on usage of their bots. In other CES news, a blog post was published Wednesday by Valve announcing new rules around how it will handle AI content on Steam. A new AI disclosure section will prompt developers to describe how their games use AI content. Valve separates the content between pre-generated and live-generated AI, and the company also said that much of the disclosure will appear on the Steam store page, so customers know what they're buying before they put down their money. Valve is also planning a new system where players can report illegal content within games containing live-generated AI. On Tuesday, the Securities and Exchange Commission's X account, which is at SECGov, appeared to have posted the following tweet. Today, the SEC grants approval for Bitcoin ETFs for listing on all registered national securities exchanges. The approved Bitcoin ETFs will be subject to ongoing surveillance and compliance measures to ensure continued investor protection. End quote. However... That wasn't something that the SEC actually posted. By the way, ETFs stand for exchange traded funds. However, what happened was a malicious actor used a SIM swap attack, took over the phone number tied to the SEC Gov account. X said Tuesday night after a preliminary probe of what happened, it found no breach of its own systems and also said the SEC's account didn't have two-factor auth enabled. Whoops. SEC Chair Gary Gensler has opposed Bitcoin ETFs in the past, although the SEC is expected to reverse course this week. Mm -hmm. A little wild ride for Bitcoin yesterday. Uh, back in March of 2023, Twitch laid off 400 people at the same time that its parent company, Amazon, went through wider layoffs of 18,000 people. Uh, today, on Wednesday, Twitch CEO Dan Clancy announced Twitch is laying off more than 500 people, and that's around 35% of its existing staff. Amazon also sent an email to employees of Prime Video and MGM Studios announcing it will cut hundreds of jobs in those divisions. Amazon has laid off more than 25,000 employees in total last year. Hewlett Packard Enterprise, or HPE, confirmed it will acquire networking gear vendor Juniper Networks for around $14 billion in an all-cash deal. The deal still needs to be approved, at which point the acquisition will double HPE's existing networking business, with Juniper CEO Rami Rahim running the combined group and reporting to HPE's CEO Antonio Neri. You might recall that back in 2015, HP split its business into two entities, including HPE, that sells servers and other equipment for data centers, and HP Inc., which makes PCs and printers. We have a couple of nice stories about tech growth today. The Semiconductor Industry Association reports the worldwide chip revenue rose 5.3% on the year, led by a 7.6% rise in chip sales in China. It's the first time we've seen growth for chips in more than a year. And Data.ai reports that consumer spending on apps rose 30% on the year across Apple, Google, and third-party app stores, mostly in China. Game spending fell 2%. 
but non-game spending in apps rose 11%, led by TikTok and generative AI apps, so like ChatGPT and stuff. Bangladesh was the fastest growing market for app spending. Have you been spending a lot? I have not. I feel no. like I'm missing something. Not me either, so it must be Bangladesh, <laughs> I guess. So. AI pin device maker Humane cut 10 people from its staff, including its CEO, who departed to spend more time with his family but continues to advise the company. Not a huge percentage of Humane's total employees, but still significant. The human device, Humane device, has not shipped yet. It's also still hiring as a company. So the company is spinning this as a reorganization, not just layoffs. Mm -hmm. TSMC reported better than expected revenue for Q4, saying demand for NVIDIA and AMD's AI devices made up for a decline in demand for phones and laptops. So more good chip news here. TSMC also says the issue with stockpiled inventory that had depressed demand has largely been resolved. So, yeah, on our way out of the chip problem, I guess. YouTube partnered with Boston's Mass General Brigham Healthcare System and the Mexican Red Cross to make videos covering what to do in basic healthcare emergencies like a heart attack. These videos will come up first in search if you're looking for help with these kinds of topics. The videos are available in both Spanish and English in the U.S. at first with more uh, countries and languages to come. All right, that's the non-CES news. Yes. Are you ready for the CES news, Let's Trish? Let's do it. All right. Google is not only merging its nearby share file sharing function with Samsung's Quick Share, but it's taken the name as well. It's like a marriage. Okay. It's taking Samsung's name. Uh, Quick Share is going to become the default in Android and Chrome OS. Google will also update nearby share for Windows, including adding support for ARM chips to that one. Uh, the new system and a new logo will start rolling out next month. Japan's Hoya showed off the vision, that's V-I-X-I-O-N-01, to help people focus their vision. They're designed by Nendo to look like futuristic shades of sorts. Inevitably, people compared them to Georgie LaForge's Star Trek visor, but they're more modern. Time of flight sensors on the front measure distance to objects, so it can adjust the lenses. The user then slides the lenses to get a centered image, then turns a dial on the right to focus each eyeball. Because there is a limited field of view, it's not meant for all-day wear, but for tasks like model kits or reading small print. It has a 10-hour battery life and IPX3 for water resistance, meaning it can tolerate a light rain, but nothing more intense. Do not go into the swimming pool with these on. It's available for pre-order in Japan for 99,000 yen, which is about 690 US dollars. Shipping in February. No international plans just yet, though. Did you see those in I person? I did. I got to try them on and check them out. They look real weird when yeah, they're on. Yeah, because they got the creepy eyes on the front. They got the creepy eyes. <laughs> uh, Vietnam's VinFast announced its VF3 utility EV coming to the U.S. This is following up the VF8 midsize crossover it brought to the U.S. last year. New VF3 is like a small, blocky SUV-looking thing. Uh, it's a bit smaller than a Mini Cooper SE. Uh, seats four people, and you can fold down the rear seat for cargo. Comes with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and gets 125 miles on a charge, so it's not going to go super far. The VF3 sells for the equivalent of about $12,000 in Vietnam, so even if it's more expensive in the U.S., it will likely be one of the most affordable uh, S uh, EVs that you can get. VinFast will start accepting reservations later this year. Also announced a Toyota Tacoma-sized truck called the VF Wild with a power-folding mid-range thing that expends... Uh, that expands from five to eight feet. No ranger timing or release on the truck yet. Hyundai spinoff Mobin has a delivery bot that can climb curbs and even some stairs. The wheels have a flexible outer wall with an articulating frame that holds their shape, and the bed tilts to keep delivery items mostly level. Mobin also plans to bring the wheels to wheelchairs and other mobility products in the future. Look for them being tested on the streets and the many, many stairs of Seoul, Korea. Oh, you've, you've experienced those stairs. I have experienced yeah, them. That me too. will be very helpful. Uh, in even smaller EV news, Squad Mobility showed off prototypes of its tiny solar-powered EVs. Squad Mobility was founded by engineers from the solar-powered car company Lightyear. Uh, it's 6.6 .6 feet long with six with cargo space for a suitcase. The Solar City car has a 250 watt peak panel on the roof that you can charge enough for a few short trips a day. In sunny Las Vegas, for example, you could expect to get around 13 miles just on the energy from the top panel. You can plug it in too. Top speed is 25 miles per hour, and the company says it's a year out from production, but hopes to sell the Solar City EV for 6,250 bucks. All right. Price of a MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Walmart executives gave a keynote address at CES on the company's plans to use augmented reality and drones and generative AI and other tech. On iOS, Walmart added some generative models to its search so you can give it use cases like supplies for a birthday party rather than searching for plates and napkins and cakes individually. Walmart also showed off a chatbot that might eventually help shoppers by talking to them about what they're looking for. Walmart will also add some generative model help to its in-home replenishment service that identifies frequently ordered items and then delivers them to your home when you need them through its smart lock powered in-home delivery service. On the augmented reality side, Shop with Friends lets you virtually try on outfits and then share the results. And Sam's Club will start using computer vision to speed up the recipe confirmation as you exit the warehouse stores. Walmart will also expand its drone delivery service to cover 75% of the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas. All right, uh, that's the that's the quick CES news. That's not all the CES news. We got you've got a ton of stuff for us uh, a little later in the show, Trish. But Sarah and I thought uh, we each pick one thing to tell you about too. Is that cool? I love this. All right, uh, I'm going to talk about the Rabbit R1 uh, that was designed with the collaboration of Teenage Engineering. It's about half the size of an iPhone with a touchscreen and Wi-Fi. But the main attraction is the software. Rabbit uses what the company calls a large action model instead of a large language model because it's trained to interact with apps and websites. So it knows what settings look like, how to read confirmations, et cetera. And it knows how to do these things so it doesn't need to be trained on a specific app. It's just trained to use apps. Uh, You press a button and ask for what you want, and then it finds the right app or website to deliver it. Here's an example. Impact on the genre. I can also use R1 to call a ride. Get me a ride from my office to home now. Of course, I will book an Uber ride for you from your office to your home. Please confirm the ride. I have six people with three luggages. Find me an Uber that can fit all of us. For six people and three pieces of luggage, I recommend booking an Uber XL, as it provides ample space for all passengers and luggage. Please confirm the ride. The ride shows up, I just hit confirm. The Uber's on my way. Yeah, so you just talk to it. You just tell it tell it what to do. Uh, you can also train it to do specific actions. They used Photoshop as an example, like looping the watermark, stuff like that. Uh, the interface itself, as, as you, if you're seeing the video, is a series of category-based cards like music, transportation, et cetera. It's there to verify that it's doing what you asked, and so you can tap confirm. Uh, and while some things work on device, a lot of them go through a portal, which they call the rabbit hole. <laughs> Where you log into services you want Rabbit to access. You're trusting them to let you log in in the cloud. Uh, It can also use a virtual machine for programs like Photoshop. It has a 2.88-inch touchscreen, a scroll wheel, and a 360-degree rotating camera called the Rabbit Eye. It's not meant to be used as a phone, but they did build in an LTE SIM slot so you can get mobile data. Rabbit only says the battery lasts all day. We didn't get milliamp hours or anything. It is available for pre-order now, and it's $199 shipping in March. Trish, what what is this? What do you th- what do you make of this? I mean, my first thought is like, okay, so is this like a smart speaker uh, sp- that you would just take with you on the go that can connect everywhere? But it it does seem like it's more than that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a- almost as if it's you know a phone just minus the the cell phone capabilities. Um, and and my question to this is, are they anticipating people carry this instead of a phone? Because I feel like. Your phone doesn't have all these capabilities, but you can certainly order an Uber XL on your own on your, your phone yeah, right, very easily. Sure. So, I mean, my question would come down to, does it work the way that they showed it in the demo? Um, mm-hmm. Or, you know, am I going to ask my bunny assistant to yeah. order me an Uber and it'll <laughs> say can understand what you're asking for over and over and over again or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they have said <laughs> they don't expect it to replace a phone, but maybe it will. So I feel like this mm. is for early adopters. At $199, it's not a steep thing for people to try out. And they want to yeah. see what people make of it. Sure. They want it to get its name out there. And mm-hmm. then my guess is they probably hope somebody wants to license the technology or build it in or partner with them or something sure. like that. Scott, what do you make of this? Well, I kind of have the same initial questions that Trisha threw out. Um, even more so, I would say, when I see him do this on the stage, what I feel like I'm watching is a thing our phones are either already doing or will do shortly. And by shortly, I just mean really the AI capability stuff. That's all coming. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that's coming. It's just 100% coming from Android, iOS, and everybody else and their dog. So 
if I'm meant to carry this and a phone, I feel a, a, a pretty big sense of redundancy here. I will say this, though. In the interim, while I don't have those things on my phone, or there is some uniqueness to this device, 200 bucks isn't too bad, you know, to yep. give it a swing and see if this thing fits your lifestyle or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm happy about where the price is. But I just think other stuff is coming, and uh, I'm not going to want two devices. I'm going to want the one that I'd also do everything else on. Yeah, yeah. And not just that device. So I have, I have concerns that way about the longevity of that. But who knows? Somebody could make a phone using this OS yeah, and its right. feature set and do it quickly. And, and maybe that's the ultimate goal here, like you yeah, said. Yeah, that's why it feels like a demonstration to me. Sarah, what do you think of it? Yeah, it, it's a tough sell to ask me to cram yet one more thing into a small fanny pack, you know, that I might have on my person, you know, out and about walking the dog type thing. I get what they're going for. I get that it's more just natural language using the apps that you already have. I think you really have to dislike the experience of launching an app to do a thing. Um, I'm used to it. So, you know, when I, when I first saw this, I was like, this is not solving a problem that I have, but maybe I don't realize that mm -hmm. it's a more cumbersome uh, situation than it could be, right? We're just yeah. used to doing things the way that we're allowed to do the things. So right now, this is not something that I would buy, even for $200, which seems you know, pretty cool. You know, kind of a, uh, kind of a if this, then that type of feel, I, I mm, think yeah, yeah. this is. But at the same time, like you said, Scott, this seems like a product that isn't going to exist for very long because the devices themselves, if they just had the capability, would negate the need for yet another thing that isn't replacing your phone. So I don't know how often I would be able to use it without also having my phone with me. Yeah, yeah. I, I want this in my phone. Yeah. Right. That, uh, and, I, and I think Rabbit knows that. And they're they're trying to get it out there. I'm, I I could make a, a, a comparison to a gaming device that maybe this isn't an entirely fair comparison, but the Playdate, which has been uniquely oh, yeah. uniquely like pop, yeah. popular, yeah, it even has a kind of look of it, right? Kind yeah. of a similar vibe. Um, that found a niche that easily could have been solved by somebody saying, "Well, why wouldn't I just get a Switch or a Steam Deck or some dedicated thing that lets me play all of these things?" Well, that's not really the point, is it? The point of the Playdate is this unique kind of retro, weirdly futuristic thing. Uh, with, with really creative ideas behind it and that sort of thing. This could be positioned as that. I think a lot of it will help. It would help to know what the build quality of this is. It's really hard to tell from mm -hmm. the stage presentation and their marketing material. But if it's a nice little solid state feeling, you know, thing that's not jittery or plasticky, I feel like I, there may be a little sub market there that we're not even thinking about. Yeah. Don't kill the rabbit. Just merge no. it into other devices. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Nailed it. Uh, Nailed Sarah, it. what was the thing you found? Well, okay. So if you've got the desk space, and my current desk does not apply, uh, you might like Gigabyte's Aorus CO49DQ 49-inch gaming monitor. Might be the monitor of your dreams. Again, if you've got the space. It was first announced back in December. It's finally getting shown off for real. Slightly curved, double quad HD, DQHD display with 5120 by 1440 resolution with a 144 hertz refresh rate, support as well. Currently listed at $1,299, although Gigabyte says the cost may drop some by the time it starts shipping. It is also 25 pounds, so not only do you, <laughs> <It's> not <mobile. laughs> do you, do you need to have uh, the space, but you need to you know, have a desk that can support something like this. Scott, we were talking a little bit before the show, uh, you know, they, they're touting this as a gaming monitor. It's a monitor that can be used for all sorts of stuff, but for gaming, what do you think? Well, all right, so they're gonna be, there's going to be a certain market that are going to grab this right away because they want the best there is when it comes to their gaming rigs, and I think this thing is beautiful and kind of breathtaking to be honest i'd be more interested in using it for more productive stuff and i don't i'm not calling games unproductive but i mean i do a lot in a wide screen as it is now to have that much more space for my workflow would be incredible so i'm actually i, I would eye something like this more for that personally than i would for gaming that being said all the specs on this thing are top notch the thing weighs about 25 pounds that's a lot for a display that's a whole lot for a display and um, it will find its market. I, I only have one problem with this, and maybe this, maybe this says, about who, it says too much about my eyeballs. But the bigger the screen, the better when you're in your living room. Mm -hmm. The bigger the screen in the office, not necessarily great for gaming. You tend to uh, have to look up 
here to see a thing in the corner or down here uh -huh. to see a thing, another UI element that you may have missed because the bigger you get, the harder that gets. And I've had a 50-inch TV, although 12 by 9 aspect ratio before, and it drove me crazy because I was missing things. You'd think it would be more immersive, but really you lose out on the seeing stuff. So I, I worry a little bit that 49, basically 50 inches, even though this is a better aspect ratio for that, uh, might be a little rough. Also, there's a lot of issues about game supporting certain ultra wides, and mm -hmm. not every game does. So I don't know. There's some give and take here. The price is going to be enormous, so I don't know that it'll be worth it for your average gamer. But there are people out there that are going to be you know, building driving sims and adding new steering wheels and having a real ball with this thing. Trace, what do you think? Oh, I totally agree, especially for racing sims. Um, but I actually don't think the price is too bad. Twelve ninety nine for something this big, I think, is pretty reasonable. Um, but in addition to certain games not supporting that amount of ultra wide, it's also really hard for streamers and content creators because there's not a lot of capture cards that support mm -hmm. uh, a resolution that looks like this. So it's very niche, but I think with that price point, I agree with Scott, it will find its audience. You know, Scott, you make a good point of how watching, you know, a, a, something on a really large TV in your living room is kind of like you're just looking at the TV, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In in gaming, you're looking at specific things on the display in front of you, whatever that display may be. You, the way that you, uh, you know, absorb and consume the content um, is not only more interactive, but it does require you to sometimes like be looking over in the left-hand corner for a while mm -hmm. type thing. You don't yeah, do that the, with TVs. Yeah, you don't do it with TVs as much, even with gaming, same games even, because you're on a couch and you're some distance away. When you're close up like this, things get a little a little weird. And to give people some, some uh, perspective here, let's say you take your average 32-inch or even 27-inch 1440p display, which is more popular with uh, gamers and non-gamers alike. Imagine two of those now. At that, at their, their default 16 by 9 ratio, stack those right next to each other. That's this display. Um, it's essentially those two resolutions mushed into one to create the final large resolution. Um, it is a lot. Now, again, from a productivity standpoint or a windowed game over here while stock prices are over here, whatever, whatever you're doing, um, and maybe even more so for streamers. I think, you know, Trish and I would love one of these for just having the space to do what you need to get done. Um, that then, then, then we're talking, but I think if you're just trying to relax in front of a video game for me, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but for me, I'm going to lose sight of stuff and that that's hard. So there's a, there's a very fine line there. Everybody's going to maybe have a different preference, but I've found that around 36 inches is just about as much as I, I want to go on a desktop. Yeah. All right, Tuesday we mentioned the agreement between SAG-AFTRA and Replica Studios over the licensing of voice actors' voices for use by generative models. The agreement includes minimum rates to replicate a voice, limitations on how long that replica can be used, some safe storage and transparency requirements, and replicas can be used in games and other media, ancillary media, probably trailers and things like that is most likely what that's for. It does not allow for voices to be used to train language models, at least not yet. Uh, actors must give consent before their voice can be replicated and can deny the right to use their voice in perpetuity. SAG AFTRA said in a blog post that the deal was approved by affected members of the union's voiceover performer community. But the deal came as a surprise to at least some voice actors. Prolific video game voice actor Steve Blum told the BBC that nobody he knew of had approved the deal. World of Warcraft voice actor Andrew Russell told the BBC the deal was garbage. And actress Shelby Young said that she was really disappointed in the union. Trisha, have you been following the story, and you know why does it seem like there's so much? Uh, I don't know. Uh, discord. Um, I have been following it, and I am a SAG after member. Not that I do video game voice acting, but I really respect the craft, and I have a lot of friends that do it. Um, and was obviously following all of the AI conversation around the SAG after strike that recently resolved. Um, but I think the biggest deal here is using a voice replica and you know or or using your image replica for the sag after strike mm -hmm. that just resolved it takes away the acting part of it mm -hmm. so sure you're licensing your voice but is an algorithm going to deliver the same performance that Christopher Judge does in God of War? Mm -hmm. Like the human interpreting the emotion of the text and telling the story that is acting. So this is taking away acting. Uh, in terms of just like, I guess I have a unique voice, you're welcome to use it. I do 
like that it's not using it to train mm -hmm. any future AI or create any synthetic voices. It is just a replica in that way. And I can see how sag after is trying to work with the new technology rather than just trying to stop it. But as a performer, like I, you know, I'm, I have a theater degree. That's what yeah. I trained in. As a performer, it's removing the acting from voice acting, and that's sad. And you, but the actor has the ability to say no. You can't sure, do it. Sure, sure, so, that's there's true. There's at least that. And mm -hmm. and I would like to say, I mean, now we can look at it and say, mm -hmm. you know, that an algorithm can't deliver the same type of performance that mm -hmm. you know Ashley Burch or Christopher Judge or Ashley Johnson or any of these people deliver in our games. But are we going to get to a point where a computer can deliver that emotionally moving of a point. performance? Yeah. I would. I, I hope that the human element of it brings something different, but that's a scary prospect. Yeah. I, I have enough friends in the voice acting business, especially in the video game acting business, to know that their biggest problem with this isn't so much the structure of it, although there are some problems with it. Some, you know, like you mentioned, someone called it garbage or a garbage <laughs> deal. Part of the problem here is that they're not all being involved. Some may have been, some may have not been. That's, mm -hmm. the, the, that's their biggest concern, is if you're going to make these sort of decisions as a collective then the collective should be involved. And I couldn't agree with that more. Like there are a lot of issues I have about the future of voice acting, AI, how it affects games or any other medium for that matter. Um, but all of those aside, this affects them directly. They are 100% the reason you need this agreement. If you're not involving them, that's the mistake. So I think that you can salvage this. You just need to open it up, talk about it, make changes where needed, get the approval of really everybody who might be involved. That means votes. That means, you know, regular union behavior. And and then come to some conclusion that hopefully fits as many solutions as you can. But right now, it's just, it sounds like it was good faith effort, but perhaps didn't have everyone in the room that should have been there. Yeah. And I haven't read the agreement, but the, the details do sound okay. I think you nailed it, Scott. Uh, everyone wanted to be asked first. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. It affects you. Yeah. yeah. So tell me. <laughs> well, folks, uh, if you want to keep up to date on the fast moving world of artificial intelligence, you should probably try listening to AI Name the Show. Uh, every week, Tristan Jutra and Tasia Custody wade through the hype and the doomsaying and all of this complicated mess and try to keep you informed about the latest news in AI. Catch it at AI Named This Show dot com. <laughs> CES is jam-packed with products and innovations in almost every category. Tricia, you've been here a few days already. Uh, it's overwhelming what's out there. Uh, what are some of your faves, though? What are your, some of your hidden finds you've, so far? So I love getting to talk to all of you because there is no possible way that one human can see everything at CES. Yeah, so I yeah. like that we're bringing different things from different perspectives. But as far as what I've seen so far, probably the thing I'm most excited about is the hidden cable motherboards that are coming out. And I kind of read and was looking forward to seeing these in person before I got here. But whether you call it, I mean, Asus calls theirs BTF motherboards, which stands for Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that they were very clear about the puns intended because all the cable connectors are on the back. I thought that was cute. Um, MSI is calling them Project Zero. Gigabyte's calling it Project Stealth. Whatever you call it, I mean, DIY PC building has gotten much more popular over the years. It's also gotten much more accessible over the years. And this takes another step in that direction where to have a really clean look and keep all of your cable management in the back, you no longer need to, you know, take everything from the back, bring it around to the front, mm. bend it in a very awkward way, which does complicate your PC build experience. Um, so it looks cleaner. It's going to make building easier. And right now, you not only need the motherboard with the connectors on the back, but you need a compatible case as well if you're mm. going to do this kind of build. And uh, Asus even showed off a specific new type of GPU that's built to go with this. I think they're, oh, nice. they might be calling it advanced BTF, um, where uh, you know the GPU plugs into the motherboard in such a way that you don't even have the GPU power connectors coming around nice. the front. So very, very clean looking, very cool. And of course, it makes me feel like I have to go home and do a completely new build. Yeah, no, it's going to make a lot of people <laughs> decide like, well, I guess this justifies starting from scratch, sure. you know, yep. which is fun, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. Uh, once you do all that hard work, you're going to need a snack. Of course. Yeah, when you have somebody build your PC for you, either a PC building company or somebody do it for you, you don't worry about it so much because they'll do a good job. They'll tie it all up the way you need it. That's part of their deal. But suddenly I'm interested in building again because that's my biggest hang up. Yeah, I cannot stand does. that rat's nest of cables. I hate it. Mm -hmm. So bring it on. This is a great <laughs> idea. And it took them way too long to do this, by the way. <laughs> way too long. This is an innovation we could have seen in 99. I don't know what's going on, but fine. <laughs> Do it now. 
I hey. love that it's happening. Yeah, better yeah. late than never. Right. And Tom, to satisfy your snack oh, urge while goodness. you're building a PC, um, another really fun thing that I saw this year, and I don't know if you saw it as well, was from Cold Snap. Mm. It's kind of like a Keurig, but for ice cream. So you can store all the ice cream components in a can that doesn't have to be refrigerated. I think they said it has up to a six month shelf life. Mm. So you can just put cans of ice cream in your pantry or whatever. They don't need to be refrigerated. You pop them into this machine, similar how you would a pot in a Keurig. Um, and then in, I think it was like two minutes or less than two minutes or something like that. Yeah, pretty clear. It freezes and distributes soft serve ice cream and it tasted delicious. It, 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 you wouldn't have known. Right? But it came from a pot. I tried it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was it was pretty pretty tasty. I mean, it wasn't gourmet or you know salt no. and straw level or anything. But for home ice cream, it was great. It, it felt to me like boardwalk ice cream. Yeah, like when you, that's you, a good way of putting it. Felt it felt like yeah. boardwalk soft serve. Mm -hmm. um, it was delicious. And for anyone that's like, oh no, Keurig, so much waste, so much disposable. Uh, the cans are recyclable. So uh, the company was definitely encouraging sustainability, and it just it seemed pretty cool. And I enjoyed tasting ice cream from a can. <laughs> Indeed, uh, that's one of the benefits. Of Yes. <laughs> I mean, my my initial question was like, okay, well, if they're in these cans that you store in your pantry, and maybe they're in there for up to six months, you're not exactly getting anything fresher than you would mm. at the store. But you're probably, if you are a household that eats a lot of ice cream, going to save a lot of money. Yeah. And yeah. sealed, so you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's, it's just sort of fun to be able to say we did it yeah, at yeah. home. Pop yeah. it out, <laughs> right? You can have ice cream whenever you want without planning, because the right. ice cream yes. will freeze or burn in yes. your freezer. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's it's very rad. I enjoyed seeing that a lot. Um, another thing I was excited to see in person because I missed it last year was Displace's wireless television. Oh right, they brought it back again. They yeah. brought it back again this year. They have some upgrades to it. Uh, you know, you can now shop with your phone by tapping your phone on the side of it if you're oh, okay. you know paying for something on the television they also have wireless charging built into it if you get their stand now um, but it was neat to see a television that is completely wireless so mm -hmm. i think the the images that were trending from ces both this year and last were them hanging the tv on a window yeah uh, and seeing no wires. And one of my questions that I wanted to ask them is, you know, as someone that uses my living room TV also to play my video games, I was like, okay, well, if I have to plug in an HDMI, does that kind of, you know, ruin the whole aesthetic here? Yeah, right. Um, but they have a little dock. They have a little HDMI dock that you can put in a closet or something like that nearby, and you plug any extra cables you want into that. So it's like the LG wireless, kind of. In I'm not way. familiar with LG's wireless. Yeah, but it's got a breakout box okay, that's right. separated, yep. and then, yeah, and then it broadcasts the, the signal over to the monitor. So it, it sounds like it works in a similar way. Yeah. Is LG's also wireless in terms of power? Uh, not for the screen. So that's a big advantage. Got on this it. One then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so dis point. Displace has about, I think they said a 30 day battery life uh, with about six hours of usage a day, which is pretty good. And last year they were hot swappable. So I assume yeah. they still are, which I, means you, you could yeah. just, you know, go in and, you know, swap out a battery while it's running. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, I, I just moved to a new apartment. I haven't mounted my TV on the wall yet. It's, <laughs> you know, on the long list of things to do. But one of the first things is like, OK, now how do I what am I going to do with the wires? Like, do, do they just hang out the bottom? You know, am I lucky enough to have an outlet that just happens to be right behind the TV? Of course not. Um, so this is not necessarily something that I'm going to buy, but. One day, one day, <laughs> all of our TVs will will say, "Remember when we used to plug in a TV? Isn't that yeah. funny?" Those are the days. Yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. It's very, very cool. Um, another thing I saw people running around with, or should I maybe say skating around with, <laughs> um, at one of the events this week is the world's fastest shoes from Shift Robotics. I, I dodged if... many a person wearing the world of master <laughs> shoes. Did you get a chance to try them? I didn't them? put them on, though, yeah. I didn't put them on because I had sandals on that day, oh, and okay. I was not about to put my feet in any shoe <laughs> robots without a lot of protection. Mm. Um, but they basically kind of looked like, if you remember moon shoes, those horrible ankle-breaking traps yeah, yeah, from, yeah. like, yesteryear. Uh, if you remember moon shoes and then roller skates, like, if they all had a baby, that would be these Shift Robotics shoes. Um, and I guess they showed this design back in 2022, but it's the first time I saw it and they it, it essentially feels like uh from what everyone has said walking around on like a people mover at the airport so mm. you're walking just like you normally walk but you're going much faster and right now they're aiming this at warehouse applications to help uh warehouse workers be more productive and get around a lot faster and easier <laughs> um but then they're you know they're talking about consumer applications moving forward and stuff like that um it does weigh about three and a half pounds per shoe so i wonder if you Ooh. you're building up those leg <laughs> muscles a little bit 
<laughs> when you're using it's it. It's a workout. Um, but it, you know, especially it, if you're using it in a warehouse. <laughs> yeah, maybe okay. a little bit yeah. after a while. But you know what? It does only have a one hour battery life right now. So mm-hmm. maybe your legs could take it for about an hour. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, as this becomes you know, a one hour battery produce, life. I yeah, mean, that's what, and it takes about an hour to charge it back up. Yeah, so okay. it'd be an hour on, yeah. hour off. At this stage, once they become more mass produced, maybe we would start to see better solutions sure, to that, sure. and also probably better price points. Um, I know they were talking about like fourteen hundred to seventeen hundred a pair right yeah, now, wow. yeah, but pricey. when they get it to the consumer market, they were saying you know we're aiming at closer to like six to seven hundred ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that uh, I mean I, I don't want to say that's not bad. But, <laughs> but for what you're getting, that seems to be, you know, a more reasonable price. It you, does. Yeah. It it's does. the same price as a humane AI pin. <laughs> sure. <laughs> for a pair of fast shoes. For a pair of the world's <laughs> fastest shoes. Um, the other thing I saw that was super cool, and I got to try this on, is the Hexar glove. The Hexar gr- glove from Microtube. It is the world's first untethered pneumatic glove for extended reality applications. Oh, okay. So like a haptics um, kind of thing? So, But it's not haptics. Yeah, That's what yeah. I thought. Okay. It's, uh, it's pneumatic, and it's got six touch points. So it's all your fingertips plus your palm, and it's using pneumatics to apply pressure in certain areas. Oh. Say if you were to grab something, it feels like you're holding something. It's giving you that resistance. If you I, – I did a demo where I had to put my hands under uh, a water fountain, and you could feel the water drops oh, on wow. your fingertips. Yeah, really? It's that really, precise? It was, it was really cool cool. Um, and so I was glad I got a chance to try it out. It's definitely not in a form that I think they're going to sell it to people at yet. Um, you know, it looks very prototypey, sure. but it was cool but to it experience it and it worked. Yeah. That yeah. is very cool. Trish, thank you for, uh, for giving us the, the insights on these. Those, those are, those are some yeah. great finds. Yeah, yeah, there were some good finds. Some real fun stuff there. Uh, thank you also for just being here all together. If folks want to find more of what you're doing, where should they go? You can follow me online at that girl Trish with no I in the girl, so it's just that G R L Trish and uh, Trisha Hirschberger on Twitch and YouTube. Fantastic, Scott Johnson. Thanks to you as always. Let folks know where your latest can be found. Well, speaking of games and some of the stuff that'll come out of CES, since we don't have uh, E3 anymore, some of the hardware stuff ends up showing up here. So we're going to talk about that at length on the show Core. We record every Thursday. And it is all video games from the industry on down to stuff we played that week. And if that sounds like fun to you, come laugh and hang out with us at frogpants.com slash core. Yeah. Patrons, you don't have to go anywhere. Stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. There's more to talk about. It's CES. You can see it behind me right now, uh, including how this show is different from, any, from other CESs. We're going to talk a little bit about our impressions as well. Reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back talking more CES with Shannon Morse joining us on the show tomorrow. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)